There are at least three important concepts from quantum mechanics that are needed in order to describe semiconductor properties, and we're going to use them a lot. So I'll just summarize them here. The first idea is the idea that electrons are almost free, but not quite. That's the quasi-free electron model, which describes an electron inside of a conductor in a, an infinite lattice of potential wells, uh, where, uh, where each well is an atom. So let me uh, sort of try to sketch out a lattice of potential wells. So I am sketching energy as a function of position and it goes up and down and there are these little wells. So this is energy, qualitatively energy as a function of where you are located. This is the potential energy, so I'll call it E sub P. Uh, this function that I've drawn is, is that. And each one of these uh, potential wells is separated by what we'll call A is the lattice constant. The lattice constant is literally had the average separation between atoms. An electron is floating around up, and conduction electron is floating around up here. Uh, flying around up here and <laughs> it's it's moving and sometimes it's over a potential well and sometimes it's not and the electron is, is is characterized by a quantity called the wave number which will be different depending on whether it's over a well or not and yeah, the wave number is given by k which is just 2 pi divided by the wave length that's the wave number and so it has dimensions of inverse length it characterizes the electron it's different whether the electron is over the well or not now, the quasi-free electron model looks at how differently a nearly free conduction electron behaves when that electron is superposed on top of this periodically varying potential energy. And in order to get to the bottom of that, we need to describe a wave function. So we have to assume a wave property of the electron. All waves have a geometric and time-dependent function that describes them. And so let me write out the wave function for an electron, an electron's wave function. And it's uh, for a free, a free electron. So if it's just floating in free space, that this, but this lattice isn't around it. Its wave function is given by psi of, and you have to give two things inside that of, a position and a time. R is the position vector in three dimensions, and that equals the amplitude, and then you have E to the J, and because we're doing a lot of electronics, we use J for the square root of minus one instead of I. K dot R, so R is the position vector in three dimensions. K is the wave number, but it, which is also a vector because you can have a different wave number if, you're head, if the electron is going in different directions. Minus the energy over h bar t h bar is Planck's constant over 2 pi t is time the h bar is just a fundamental constant and t is time so that's the wave function let me talk about this uh, energy of h bar thing you might recall from general physics that energy is for, for a photon anyway is h times f h is Planck's constant f is frequency well that, that's true for an electron as well Rearrange that, and the frequency is E over H. So an electron, as well as a photon, as well as a, a, any particle, can be characterized by a frequency and a wavelength. And if we were to multiply by 2 pi, 2 pi F is omega, so the omega is 2 pi E over H. Well, 2 pi over H is H bar. E over H bar is the angular frequency omega, and you'll often see omega T instead of E over H bar T. If I go and put my electron in a periodic function, superpose it on that thing that's, uh, that I sketched up there, the wave function has to be modified a little bit. And instead of a constant coefficient in front, now we'll have a spatially dependent coefficient, u of r, where I, I just put the, the k subscript k on the u in order to remind us that this is something that has a wave number of k. The U has a spatial period of A, the, the lattice constant. So U is a periodic function that changes this back to the same value every time uh, you've uh, translated distance A. So that's the, the quasi-free electron model. And the thing to remember is that we describe an electron with a wave number, 2 pi over lambda. Second concept is dispersion, which is the, the relationship between energy and wave number. Free electron has a dispersion relation, which is quadratic in K. Energy 
of a free electron is h bar squared k squared. So that, that's the thing to note. k squared is a, a dependence. So energy is quadratic in the wave number k for a free electron. In the event that the electron is in one of these periodic potentials, so you've superposed on top of that, you have a different dispersion relation. Now the, you have to add to that h bar squared k squared over 2m, which is what it had when the electron was free. You have to add to it that literally that, that potential energy that it is in. For the quasi-free electron model, the potential energy background is a perturbation on the total energy. These two terms are specific things. The first term is the kinetic energy. Because, you know, if you have a free electron just flying through space, that's all it's got, kinetic energy. So that h bar squared k squared over 2m is just kinetic energy. And this e sub p is that background that it, it's superposed upon. That's the potential energy. The k dependence of energy, then, is not purely quadratic look at e sub p actually uh, you, you'll conclude that oh there's actually a different k dependence than just quadratic but the kinetic energy is, is always you know quadratic in k it's just that uh, there are places where the dispersion will be dominated by the potential energy now this is different for example uh, from the dispersion of say light uh, if i look at a photon the energy is very decidedly planck's constant times the frequency of the light and that's the energy in each photon. It's a completely fixed amount for that, that frequency. Now let's rewrite something. Remember, remember that little three-letter equation that, that the speed of a wave is the wavelength times the frequency? Let me replace frequency with c over lambda, where c is the speed of light. Let's divide and multiply by 2 pi. Divide h by 2 pi, and then multiply 2 pi c over lambda. Now why would I do that? Because then I say, oh, h over 2 pi is h bar. 2 pi over lambda is k c. The dispersion relation of a photon is linear in k. Energy is linear in k. It's not quadratic like it is for a free electron. Energy, the dispersion relation for a photon is linear. Dispersion doesn't have to be linear or quadratic, and for a conduction electron in a solid, it's going to be something else. It's going to be like uh, energy is k to the the, the, the 1.6 or so, something like that, and, then, and it will it will vary but with k as as an as an electron has a shorter and shorter wavelength, uh, it will have a different energy that's that's not just is going linearly or quadratic in, in that that two pi over lambda value. I think we need one more quantum concept, and that's the de Broglie relation, then, which, which literally is the wave-particle duality. So if uh, you've heard that photon is a, was it a particle or a wave, this, you can say the same thing about an electron, is it a particle or a wave. In fact, you can say the same thing about just about anything. But, but really small particles manifest this, this wave-particle duality pretty well. Anything with uh, wave properties, therefore, you know, has a wavelength. To begin describing wave-particle duality, I need to bring up the concept of group velocity, which is really the exact same concept as is used in signal analysis. Uh, the group velocity in quantum mechanics, you write it as, well, you write it as dE by dK, just like you would in signals, but uh, you would have the h-bar in there as well. If you did unit analysis on this expression, 1 over h-bar d energy over dk, you'd actually find that it has dimensions of speed because it actually is a speed. Let's use our free electron dispersion relation first of all. V group is 1 over h-bar d by dk of h-bar squared k squared over 2m. Evaluate that derivative and oh, what we're left with is h-bar k over m. Right away, we actually learned something really, really important. Do you remember, classically, momentum is mass times velocity, or rather, velocity is momentum over m. Oh, well, look at this. Group velocity is something over m. I think you can only come to the conclusion that h bar k is some kind of momentum. In fact, h bar k is momentum. And that's a keeper. You really need to internalize that. You're going to use that one if you do anything quantum mechanical. Let's just continue the exercise. Replace h bar with h over 2 pi. Replace k with 2 pi over lambda. 
And uh, we can also say momentum is h over lambda, another keeper. You want to write those things down in your notes and, and keep them. But let's do a quick little example. Let's find the wavelength of an electron that's moving at 50,000 meters per second. Lambda is Planck's constant over momentum. I'll go ahead and uh, replace momentum with mv, m sub e for the mass of the electron. And we're, we're dealing with a free electron, so I'm not going to deal with anything but the free electron mass. 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34 joule second. That's one manifestation of Planck's constant. And then there's another version, which is uh, in the electron volt seconds. And divide by the mass of the electron, 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. And the velocity we were just given of 50 meters per second. And that evaluates out to 14.6 nanometers. So here you have an electron, which you always thought was a particle, and I just calculated the wavelength of it. It's 14.6 nanometers, which, by the way, is getting on the order of things that, that in the system that an electron bumps into. That, that's on the order of, you know, like of layer thicknesses. It's on the order of feature sizes. It becomes a, a rather critical thing as, as features get down into the nanometer range. Now they're, they're on the order of an electron's wavelength. Now the physics becomes very quantum mechanical. Uh, and point out one, one more thing just so we know. When the speed is greater than, oh, maybe the speed of light over 10, things change. Special relativity takes over, and, and, and we, we have a little more complexity in, in how we treat things. We won't be dealing with that in this course because uh, even ballistic transport won't do that necessarily. Now, anyway, those are three quantum concepts for you to review. That's it for now.